so it was really amazing to hear about the ways in which uh, each of you have you know, made things in the lives of many patients, our families, and, and my work uh, possible that were, were unimaginable just a, a short time ago. Um, for people who have knocked down uh, so many barriers, I would interested to hear um, what on your mind is uh, the biggest challenge to keeping you from taking the next step? So is there data that you would want access to or to be able to connect um, in a way that you've not been able to? Well, <clears throat> I remember I was um, at a large data company uh, meeting in their sort of AI institute, and they were saying, isn't it terrible how healthcare institutions don't share their data? Surely they want to advance healthcare. I said, it's truly, truly terrible. Yeah, it's terrible how these healthcare institutions hold on data. And you know, it's terrible that these, all these big data companies hold on to their data. And then I went on, but it's also terrible that this seems to be part of the human condition. Even patient advocacy groups end up holding on to their data. And when they don't see eye to eye, even in very narrow syndromes, you'll see lack of sharing. So I think it's very simple, and abstractly, very difficult in practice. But I think if we make a compact so that if we recruit a patient to any study, they instantly, their data becomes available as a formatted data object that they can redonate to other studies, I think that would be transformative. Because A, you would recognize who's in charge of the data. It's not your data, my data, it's the patient's data. Second, it would give the actual implementation whereby you can actually share data. And it's, this is not just wishful thinking. Um, We've been involved in something called Sync for Science, where we had six of the top EHR vendors agree to a certain uh, set of FHIR APIs, F-H-A-I-R, to share data from the EHRs with uh, the, the, the donation uh, recipient that the patients direct them to as part of the All of Us campaign. And Apple is using that very same uh, API. So I think that getting the understanding that out of the starting gates, if you sign up for a study, immediately the data is repurposable by the patient. That would change things. Yeah, so I'm, I'm fairly optimistic that because of people like you that we're going to you know, succeed in, in efforts like this. And I think that there are going to be much more data of different types in many different people's hands eventually. And I'm interested in the, the question, um, maybe from Geraldine or uh, Deckel, um, you know, as you see um, more people sharing data or getting access to data, be it on Facebook or people using uh, the face to gene app, what are the cases in which it seems like you know, perhaps this is a person who's currently best supported or you know, is making perhaps what could be considered misuse of the data? And are there scalable strategies um, for helping both professionals and patients who we all, all serve in both roles and you know, deal with data that we wouldn't have had an experience to, or an opportunity to interact with before? Yes, well, I think that um, misuse of data is, is, is something that we should all be uh, uh, worried about. And I think, you know, obviously, uh, I've not witnessed any misuse of data firsthand, but uh, I think that uh, we need to get the regulator uh, and the legislators more involved in how to uh, use data. And I think that's actually going to accelerate um, uh, the environment of sharing data. So contrary to what most people think, uh, even though we're a private company, we, we are actually supporting the idea of sharing data. Um, and we have had discussions like this in the past. Um, I think that sharing data will allow us uh, as a company to collaborate with other groups and in fact accelerate and promote our technologies rather than be fearful of, of competition. Um, so that's you know, my take on, on misuse of, of data. And I think it's, it's pretty apparent that the more data you collect, the more diverse the data is, the better the outcomes of the technology. So hope I answered your question. I'd be interested in going back to your first question, actually. You know, we have some personal experience with families trying to go and get their EHRs to submit to our registry, and that was an incredibly difficult and resource-intensive process. Um, so I, I, it was an eye-opener for me how difficult it was for patients whose data, their own data they were trying to access was to obtain. Um, I think the second uh, lesson learned for us 
is that the genetic data that we have in our registry, we ask families to upload their genetic reports, and we have genetic counselors who curate that. And we've been you know, thinking about what's a way that we can automate it, and it really turns out this, at this point, we need human pe experts, genetic counselors, to do that work, because there's so much variability in what the clinical reports look like, and we've actually found errors where we've, our genetic counselors have had to go back and call labs to get clarifications. And so that is one of the areas I, I, I don't know how to solve that problem. I just know that that's a problem if you're going to try to compare utilized genetic data in your research. No, I think I would echo that as well. So it's not just the sharing of data, it's sharing of the right data. Um, and by that, in many ways, I mean all of the data. Um, so one of the things that's, that's critical is access to diverse genomic data, but more important in many ways is access to really good clinical data, that phenotype data. And one of the things that I think we've seen over the last few years, which is great, is many more studies that are doing uh, this sort of uh, holistic testing and, and generating genomic data. But I feel like we're not doing as good a job with the phenotype data. I think every study that we do now, we should be collecting good phenotype data for every single one of those studies and all of that needs to end up in one place and we need people to go in and make sure that the data is high quality um, so a lot of data science principles now coming into medicine which is pretty pretty cool but scary so this is this uh, recapitulates i think uh, what i all saw about the future is unevenly distributed and it is unfortunately even past excellence is unevenly distributed so good phenotypic clinical ascertainment is not the same. You can tell a very brainy fellow who assesses a patient but doesn't know how to really see the picture misses it. Mm. And you can see people, we had contests, for example, we've had contests where we made exomes available on families. And what's stunning to me was not that several international teams won, but among the teams who won were the same hospitals where the patient had previously been seen with the same data and not diagnosed. Mm. And so, this is what our colleague here, I think, brought up about education. That's, I think, the second big roadblock, is doctors are not well educated in this regard. And I'm reminded of a study that was done in 2003. 2003. So you're going to ask yourself, ask yourself Socratically. In 2003, if you ask primary care providers, have you ordered a genetic test for cancer susceptibility? in the prior year, in 2003, what percentage of the PCPs had ordered such a test? In 2003. I've asked this question for over 500 august medical audiences, and the modal answer is 0 or 1 percent. The actual answer is 30 percent. And when you ask what was the greatest predictor of the doctors ordering that test, it's not the age of the doctor, it's not where they're trained, not they're getting a family history, it's the patient's Googling a family history and then asking for the test. And these same doctors in many studies have been shown neither to be competent nor, nor a confident in inter or comfortable in interpreting these tests. So the educational part of it is really very important. And even if we get to sort of full, narrow AI, getting that in the hands of competent doctors or figuring out a way to get a lot more genetic counselors is key. That echoes our experience in surveying patients and providers in terms of access to genetic testing in the field of autism, which I know is also of interest to you. And the single strongest predictor of whether or not a patient had genetic testing related to their child's intellectual disability was if they had asked for it. So I see that we have a couple of people who have gathered at the, the microphones. We can start on this side. Yeah, hi. Um, it's Jonathan here from WebShield and the EP3 Foundation. Uh, people are now calling me Gandalf for some reason. but. Um, and uh, I think I'll come up with a new diagnosis. We call it the chronic data obstructive disorder. Uh, and another one, which is the uh, catastrophic leakage syndrome when it comes to data. And that's the, cap the uh, Cambridge Analytica side of the equation. Um, so if you want to cure a disease, you have to accurately diagnose the underlying causes and also be honest about uh, the current therapies we have to treat this disease. You know, what, what's, wh why are they failing? So when you deal with privacy, there's basically two approaches. You either get consent from the subject or you get the data de-identified. Well, the problem is right now, there's no way to agree across this, these different organizations and systems when you're talking about the same person. 
So you're talking thousands of different data sources when you talk about devices, genomic claims, clinical labs, so on and so forth. So if you can't agree that this consent form you have signed is the same person as all those other data, why is that a valid consent? If you go with, uh, with de-identification, there's a couple problems there. One is once you've de-identified it, you can't link it into a longitudinal record, which is what you actually need. And then when it turns out some of these data sources are suspect or potentially wrong or just missing, there's no way to reach out to the clinician or the caregiver or the patient themselves or some device to actually fill in those blanks. And if you look at HIPAA, it says in the law that if you know you can re-identify with reasonable effort, then it is not de-identified. Well, these days there's so much data out there, you can always re-identify it. If it includes genomic information, you can always re-identify it. So there's actually no legal way with the traditional approach, those therapies for treating this problem, um, where enterprises in the end of the day end up with the data. You want me to give my data from my enterprise to your enterprise, then you, once you have the, the keys to it, you get all the data. That's an insoluble problem. So of course the EP3 Foundation has a solution for that, but I'm wondering if any of you guys know of something we can include in the EP3 Foundation's approach. Uh, I know you've thought a lot about models for consent. So I, what I, I think we're hearing is two um, qu questions. One is, how do we link the same person across all these different data sets? The linking problem, which is not solved anywhere because, of course, people talk about common health identifiers, but, you know, your exercise, your Fitbit, many aspects of life are not linked to your health record. So even if you're in Denmark, you don't have it all linked in. So how do you link reliably to the same patient? The other is the identifiability or re-identifiability of data. And that's a fundamental, it's not a technical question. It's really not a technical question. It's a sociological question. What do we want as a society? And so let me give you an example. In uh, Massachusetts a few years ago, someone uh, took a camera phone, uh, camera phone photograph up someone's skirt on the MBTA on our public subway system. And the person uh, was charged with uh, a crime and the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts dismissed it because it was in the public and there was no new actual nudity and therefore there was no crime. Huge hue and cry across men and women. How could this be? And within two weeks, the following happened. Did they say, no, we're going to lock down all iPhones so you'll have to have typical blockchain authentication? Did they say, no, you'll have to give a DNA fingerprint to ensure they use the phone? No, they said, it is illegal to do these privacy-breaking things, even if they're in, in public. It's bad citizenship. And that was it. So if it's illegal to join these things, if what we're worried about with Facebook and Google, if we consider those things as not societally acceptable, just set that as, bad as a, a, a definition of bad behavior. On the lickability, there's all sorts of technical ways of doing it, but it, in the end, it should start with a good consent. And I think getting a single consent or a small number of consents is key. The linkability issue is much less hard than saying, do these five different consents that the patients g gave allow me to join the data? Because they're all slightly different. I think these problems will, will solve themselves as the actual use of the data becomes more and more urgent. And why it's really important that we have these patient advocacy organizations is when you hear the, from the patients and the parents, I want this to be so, a lot of the arguments go away, which is why I go to bed with a t-shirt that says, PMS, it's not what you think. <laughs> Thank you. I almost got a brick thrown at me by my wife until I explained what was going on. <laughs> I'm glad you're wearing our shirt. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think when you talk to patients with rare disease, rare disease in particular, they want their data to be used to solve these really difficult health problems, right? So as a foundation, we're struggling to answer these questions that you're asking about, trying to figure out how we share our data with other research studies, how we integrate it with our natural history study that John is part of. How do we make that happen? And, and those are big questions that we're trying to figure out. I thought yesterday's discussion in the afternoon, um, the, the discussion group was really really relevant to this to, to this point that we're really struggling with. So. But I think part of that, yes, this discussion leads on from that. So if you have a rare disease or somebody in your family does, you're incentivized already to share the data, do whatever it takes to try and help. If people who don't, there has to, don't yet have their disease that they will get, because we'll all get one, 
uh, how do we incentivize those folks? I think that's another question. I think it's question such a well. tough question. You know, how, how, do you, uh, how do you engage undiagnosed patients in rare disease? And as you were talking, I was actually thinking about Charles' secondary Lennox, diagnosis of Lennox Gisto syndrome or infantile spasms, where potentially, you know, if you could get into that community and interact with those patients, you might be able to do, you know, genetic screening yeah. on those patients at a very, very early age and ho avoid that whole seven-year diagnostic odyssey. You know, well, you know we, we accredit academic health centers. And I would argue, let's put the academic back into academic health center and require that if you see a patient, you should at least offer them the option to opt in with a consent into these studies. It's your obligation as an academic center. And we know from many studies that a small minority of patients will choose not to consent. But that will get us right to the question of, you know, you've done many of these as well. Who's paying for the court? You know, there's a, there's a yes. financial thing yes. that has to be ironed out there. Even if it's just your clinical coordinators, the time to do that is often used as a blocker, even for patients that have rare disease and really need a diagnosis. So I think that I agree with you. And it's used as a blocker all the time. Some of it is, I think, a real concern, and some of it is a BS concern to get in the way. And so the question, but it's really a matter of workflow. Mm -hmm. Can we get the workflow so... All informatics, right? So that, well, no, it's, 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 it's communication. Yes, all of it, yeah. C communication. We agree to a lot of things mm -hmm. uh, in our daily lives. This is pretty important stuff. Can we just agree? Is there an interaction that may be automated or may have a, a human counselor? It's worth the effort. Again, as an academic health center, it's part of our mission. Mm -hmm. Well, the challenge is that in LA County alone, there are eight or 38,000 Rosa Gonzalez's, uh, and 800 of them have the same social security <coughs> number, and many of those have errors in their social security numbers. So like Chimes, uh, the College for Health Information Management Executives, got tired. They lobbied actually part of the 21st Century Cures Act, figure out a way to do patient identity matching. So they had a two-year contest, a million dollar prize, a bunch of people will adopt if you come up with. They had 700 applicants, and after two years, they said, I'm sorry, we have to suspend the challenge. Mm -hmm. Nobody's got anything. Now, the, about halfway through that, I say, hey, we, you know, there's no one technology that's going to solve this problem. There is a way to do it, but not by putting a million dollar prize out. Now, now what we're doing with the EP3 Foundation and the Trusted Exchange Accreditation Program, which has Safe Biopharma, which is an identity credential uh, certification body is accepted globally. ENAC, Electronic Network, uh, Healthcare Network Accreditation Commission, Electronic Health, or EHI, and WEDI, work group for EDI, are saying, we know how to do that. We'll get a nationwide network that can actually verify any person, link them to all their records, their devices, so you can, ha and then have the network FedRAM certified. So the federal government says, this person, under their individual right of access, has a right to this data, give it to them, but we're not going to tell you who's asking, or if the CDC has a right, or if a plan sponsor has a right. So when you have a shared resource that's certified where you don't have to educate people, it just I, works, I ask then you just can solve it. Wrap the, the comment, and um, I do think it's a great point you make, and to reflect back, I think it's really interesting about all the effort we give to identify which patient in a population of millions may have a rare disease, and what you're asking is the diagnosis is what the patient's identity is. And there's a lot of the tools that are used to figure out which disease they might have, which might be purposeable to figure out who they are. So I, I would be hopeful there'd be good some, some lessons learned this morning on, on how that can uh, be facilitated and scaled. Thank you, thank you thank for you. raising that. Just been waiting patiently on this side. Thanks. Um, stellar panel. I appreciate you guys being available today. Thank you. Uh, clinical question for Professor Kahana and Ms. Bliss. Did you find um, an ideal drug combination to help control seizures for your son? I'm thinking like Dalpro-8 derivative, uh, topiramate, lamotrigine, any of those, plus maybe a benzodiazepine? Yeah, so Charles takes a cocktail of six medications right now, so six epilepsy medications and, and like five other medications to counteract the side effects <laughs> of those drugs. So he takes a lot right now. He also had a corpus callosotomy five years ago, and that was wonderfully effective for controlling his drop seizures. So he continues to have other seizure types, but um, you know his quality of life is better now that he's not um, having as many injuries. And you think, you know, that's such a great question. You know, what actually works in the patients? And so we hope that in our registry we'll be able to collect um, some data eventually about what drugs paper patients are taking and what's actually working for various symptoms. We don't yet have that 
capability, but we really would like to build that in. I think that's one of the things that we can do with patient registries. And certainly, you know, the ability to integrate EHRs is going to be very helpful in that question. So I don't want to give you an answer. I want to give you a pointer to, to a great answer. Go look up some videos by Matt Might. Thanks. Matt Might has a kid who has, like Geraldine, it's terrifying. I mean, it's terrifying to have a kid who's seizing all the time and having these bad seizures. So he's gone and gone into this small molecule screening mode where he's actually made some progress. And he's doing something as a parent that 99% of the neurologist docs who take care of these kids do not do. And so again, it shows the power of this new way of looking, this patient-driven way of looking at, at medicine. It's not going to work for everybody, but it's certainly moving the, the uh, needle a lot faster than we are doing as a classical conventional healthcare system. I kind of want to, oh, sorry. Oh. I was just going to, I was also going to say, you said something that I think is also really important, and that's the poly drug interactions. And so um, the ability to gather that data so we can start to understand in a rare disease patient yeah. who has a different physiology, uh, perhaps, uh, particularly in that particular pathway. Um, that data so we can start to understand that better and do a much better job there is also part of that data gathering that we need to do. So. I wanted to revisit a point Zach made a few minutes ago. You know, um, often patients are the first provider they see besides their primary care physician, maybe will be a physical medicine specialist because in our community, for instance, the kids have some gait issues, a little bit sometimes delays in learning to walk or crawl. Um, or maybe it's a psychiatrist because their child is having really difficult behaviors. Or maybe it's a neurologist if their child has seizures. And so each of one of these doctors may be that sort of the first point of care for the family. And depending on their background, they may or may not refer patients for genetic screening. Now, I've talked to fabulous clinical neurologists who have told me, I don't actually refer patients for genetic screening because I don't really know what to do with that data when it comes back to me. I'm like, well, why don't you refer them to genetics? And their answer is, because there's a six month wait, they're backlogged. And then once they get the report, it takes another six months to interpret it. And so they're kind of avoiding the issue. And so I feel like part of the solution needs to be just genetic education for, for, for all, the, whole, the whole of society, but in particular for anybody who's going into medicine, they should be educated enough to know how to refer patients and to at least make that initial interpretation of the findings when they come back. There's clearly a theme of need for education. One of the things that Deckel said earlier I thought was actually a, a big statement about face to gene and the idea that it was so exciting that it had not figured out what was going on, but prompted someone to think about something they hadn't thought about before and just how, how powerful that is. So I, yeah, I think that that's, as I said, the most powerful thing that I can hear from our users. And it's much more exciting for me uh, because that really f reflects the way that our users are interacting with technology. And so uh, it, it is that fabric of human interaction with technology that I think is going to promote even what you just asked for. It's, it's not about teaching everyone to understand genetics, but it's using technology to facilitate better triage, better interpretation, better workflows. Um, and that's where I think that AI is heading now in healthcare. Uh, yeah, over here. Um, hi, I'm Samantha from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. My question's for Geraldine. Um, so the PMS Foundation's done incredible work to build a patient registry and engage with researchers in forming a research agenda and collaborating. I imagine that this is like a lot of work for groups and I'm curious to hear um, your thoughts on whether other patient foundations and communities are doing the same thing? Yeah. What are some of the blockers to doing what you have achieved? And what are some of the things that researchers, clinicians, and others can do to help? Right. So when we started, there was pretty much, well, almost no research happening in Thalen McDermott syndrome. So we felt we needed to do this. But now there are all these um, groups that are sort of uh, forming around different specific genetic causes of autism and intellectual disability and neurodevelopmental disability. And they're all talking about going down the same path we are, at, which has taken incredible resources from our foundation. As a rare disease group, we're by definition small. It means we don't have buckets of money. And so it's just, I think each one of these groups is trying to answer the same questions and solve the same problems. And so one of the side projects that we have going on right now is with a group called Agenda, and it's an informal 
formal alliance of genetic disorders that are affiliated with autism. And we're all beginning to work together now on trying to figure out how we can sort of consolidate our registry efforts and utilize common biomarkers and develop outcome measures that can be used really consistently across all of our diseases. And I think that's really going to need more resources. We're all doing this kind of informally, just knowing that it's the right thing to do. But we're also all very small foundations with a lot of work that <laughs> needs to happen. And so that we just really see that as a, as a huge area that, that needs more attention. I think that's really going to be the solution in the end for us to try to work together and collaborate on trying to solve these problems. Yeah, thank you for yeah. that question. I'm yeah. glad agenda came up this morning. Yeah. I think that's an area that's really accelerating as this federation of patient groups and platforms that support that. Over here. Hi, <clears throat> I'm David Bergman. I'm the medical director of the Complex Care Clinic here at Stanford Children's Health. And uh, we probably have a large number of kids with undiagnosed rare diseases. And families frequently come up to me and they've scoured uh, Google and various other sites, talked to other families. They ask me about a possible therapy and I say, well, you know, it's really not evidence-based. Uh, I scoured the literature out there. Uh, there were no randomized controlled trials uh, that could really support this. If I go to your insurance company, they're not going to pay for it because it's not evidence-based. Frankly, I'm beginning to feel tyrannized by evidence-based medicine um, because I know we never have enough money to do enough randomized controlled trials. And even within these trials, there's probably a tremendous amount of information loss on patients who do respond uh, and patients who don't respond. So in light of this, I wonder if we're in need of a rethink for what is evidence-based medicine. Uh, and I would love to hear your thoughts on that. So again, I, I just report on what I see. So there is a very useful tension between, on the one hand, families, individuals for which nothing is working, where there's a huge need. And on the other hand, the absolute need to protect ourselves, our loved ones, and our patients from charlatans and um, liars. And so we don't want to err on the side of paternalism, but we don't want to err on the side of just letting anything happen that could be arbitrarily harmful. And the clearest example of that debate is in the right to try legislation, which some families, like Mike's family, has had passed in different state legislatures, which allows you to try. The current FDA is going for it. Previous FDA commissioners think it's a bad idea. And it comes down to where you think we should be in the terms of societal protection of our unfortunates versus paternalism. That balance is all about that. And finding the right point, again, is a public sociological discussion. It's not a scientific discussion. It's where do we want our values to be. It's another one that requires, let's go back to the education part of it. Society, in order to come together to make those sorts of decisions, have to be much more educated than they are in this area. So. Very good point. Yeah, let's try and get in another couple questions here. Hi, my name is Alex. I'm an emergency medicine physician. My question is for Dekel. Um, being in very involved in medical education training um, of lots of different junior doctors, I was wondering, do you have uh, public access to your resource for the faces identification? It'd be great, faces being as rare as they are and phenotypic recognition being hard for humans also. Um, do you publicly make your resource available um, so or is it limited access? So first of all, uh, we do make it publicly available and free of charge. The only limitation is that our software and our different applications are open only to healthcare providers or healthcare professionals. And the sole reason that we do that is that we just don't want to create anxiety with parents uh, misinterpreting the results that we show. So there's a basic level of education that needs to be introduced um, to using our applications. So yes, uh, we make them publicly available and all the educational material as well, and we'd be happy to work with uh, anyone. In fact, we've been working with uh, a variety of different stakeholders in the rare disease space, patient advocacy groups, uh, interpretation platforms, and uh, um, great initiatives like the UDN, which we're talking on, on, on you know, what are the best practices to incorporate this technology. So absolutely. Thank you very much. And regarding the last question, I'd just like to say that parachutes are not evidence-based. 
What is that? Parachutes. Parachutes. And we'll take a, a final question over here. Uh, my name is Dan Shortino uh, with the Genetic Disease Screening Program here in California. And I oversee a biobank as part of my duties. And we have a large biobank. And, um, you know, we're all for um, solid um, informed consent, consents from patients who want to share their data with various research studies. Um, however, there's a great um, misunderstanding in the public or lack of education. So we've had some bad press recently because it's very difficult to explain um, to a public audience what we do and what the safeguards are. And it almost seems like we really need to get out there and advocate, not just for different disorders, but for sharing data in a meaningful fashion that does not you know, bring up the uh, Cambridge Analytics issue. Um, so I wonder what you had to say about that. Some broader um, sharing of information, education, to the media and to the public that would help us all. I sense that that question takes us back to this balance between what's um, sort of a sociological you know, policy uh, opinion versus you know, what the, the actual rules and, and regulations are and how those things interact. Um, and so much has changed in this space in terms of the types of data that can be you know, extracted from a person um, and where it might go and, and how fluid uh, that can be. Does anyone else have something to add on that? I don't know how to really answer how to solve the problem. I, I can just, just a caution would be that, you know, in rare disease in particular, it's easy to identify patients with very limited information. So everybody should really be thinking about how they're protecting the, the confiden confidentiality of their patient's data. It's very, very easy to figure out who patients are in rare, rare diseases. I think, it's, I think it's a plane that we're sort of building as we're, we're flying yeah. here, and we're going to figure it out together. Because it's, it's, it's really it's unprecedented, I think, the, what, what can happen with people's data. So I wanted to ask everyone to join with me in thanking our panelists again for a wonderful discussion. Thank you.